Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Virio, Emirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. A Tale of Two Cities, Early Adoption Stories by Scott Duncan. Hi, I'm Scott Duncan. I do uh, basically these days nothing but Agile and coaching and training. Uh, for the past three years, I've been doing it for organizations that are big. Uh, uh, they are places that are scattered all around the world, all around the country. They have locations all over the place. And um, most of them decide they want to do Agile. And mostly I get brought in after they've already decided to do that, and they've already decided to start it in some way, and they either realize that things are not working the way the book said or the class said, or they run into something that the book and the class didn't teach them about, or they just are having a terrible time and want somebody to help come bail them out. Um, now, it turns out these experiences I'm going to talk about when I was working with a very large consulting firm. Um, so I was kind of embedded in these organizations for months, uh, like it or not. Um, now, this of course comes from the Dickens story, and it's actually a flake from the original Dickens Tale of Two Cities. Um, does anybody know what the first words in the, the book are? It's the best of times, time. time. it was the worst of times. Yes. So you may see what, what that means in the context of this when we get into it. So, there's Company F and Company N. One was a financial services company, one was a network hardware kind of development company. Um, the business territory for Company F and City F was basically North America. Puerto Rico, the United States, Canada. They had 2,500 to 3,000 offices where customers could come and get services from them. Um, this, they were not credit card, they were not banking. <laughs> wasn't that sort of thing. Um, for City and they were all over the world, basically. I mean, there were some parts of the world where they really didn't have the business going, but basically they were all over the world. Uh, why did they decide to do Agile and, by the way, they were doing Scrum? Um, well, City F had some projects that were already running using Agile and Scrum, and someone had convinced this particular project that this would be a good thing to do. Um, turns out about six months later, uh, after they engaged me to be involved with them, um, they had an agile coach who basically had read some books. And they finally decided to get someone who had done it for a while. And so they brought me in. Um, actually, they brought me in for a week while this guy was on vacation. And I left, and they kind of said the next week, where'd he go? Uh, went back. So, um, but they had had some projects. And they went to see one of these projects finally. They heard the reports, and some senior managers said, oh, great. They went to see one of the projects, and they said, gee, this is nothing like we even read in the books about. What the heck is this agile about? But they were going to do agile. In uh, the other one, City N, a uh, development manager really thought it would be a good thing to do, and other, other development managers in the company were doing it, so we basically said, we're, we're going to convince the development people to do Agile. And so that's how, that, those are the two reasons they got into it. And I could never find any deeper reason behind it. Uh, well, eventually they learned the, oh, we want to reduce cycle time, we want to do this, we want to do that. But the real reasons they got into it for those reasons. So what were the projects? What, was it, what were they working on? Well, City App was basically rehosting and um, integrating with Vendor Middleware a system that basically ran their 2,500 to 3,000 locations. This is the software that ran their business day after day after day after day. They were basically doing a bet the company rewrite of this system because it was on mainframes uh, with, with kind of custom developed middleware from a vendor who like it disappeared years ago. Um, a lot of the screens look suspiciously like they were basically copied from 3270, but now they had colors and buttons on them, um, basically. Um, but it was running their business. Um, City N, basically, they were integrated with a vendor product, and it was used by maybe 300 salespeople around the world. Um, so City N basically sold to resellers. They didn't deal directly with consumers. City F dealt with consumers directly. Both systems, though, regardless of what the company's, were, their, their business was, both systems were internal sales and account support systems, uh, except that because of the fact that City S actually dealt with uh, end users and customers, there was an aspect of the system they were enhancing to allow customers to remotely be able to check up on their services. I will also say that City S system um, was such that if you went into any one of those 2,500 or 3,000 locations, and started doing business with them, if you went to any one of the other locations, uh, those locations would not have access to your, 
all of your information. So you'd have to carry it with you in a sense on paper. And then when you went in there someplace else in the country to try to do business with them, you had to note information that that office wouldn't know. Everything was on local servers in offices. That, and they would upload kind of a summary file. But basically, you couldn't have access. So that was one of, another impetus for doing this, was they wanted to integrate all of this so that finally, if you went into one of the offices, um, you could actually be treated as if they knew who you were, no matter where you went in North America. And again, the other, the other one was basically being used by a few salespeople, comparatively speaking. Um, each one of those offices, by the way, had five or six people in it. So basically, the software was touching anywhere from 15 to 18,000 people. Um, the sales process. This company had one sales process. All those offices used the sales process. The other company, since it was spread all around the world, had five different locations, five different world regions. Uh, each one of those regions had their own way of doing things, and within the regions, people did things in different ways themselves. So they also had the challenge of trying to make a system that would either work that way or would move the sales process to something that was a little bit more uh, similar around the world, which is really what the uh, company wanted, but the sales business was so very independently run that that was a struggle way above the level of the project I was working with. So who was involved in this? Well, when they decided to go do some training, um, basically neither side trained any contractors or other employees except for the few who were going to be directly involved as either product owners or scrub masters or basically those kind of folks. So nobody else got any training outside. So they went to basically a scrum master training class, both companies actually. That's how they got their training. Um, and they picked business and IT managers and some business staff to go there and presumably be, become product owners and, and scrum masters. Uh, City and basically sent business and IT VAs and some development leads to be scrum masters um, and, and a few others. Uh, a few managers from City and went. Uh, all the managers actually on the, on the anticipated project, and that was about 15, went to the scrum master training class so they would know exactly what everybody else was experiencing. They'd understand what they were, uh, their folks were being taught. Uh, the scrum masters in the uh, city F were basically business leaders <coughs> initially. That's where, that's where they came from. Uh, on the uh, city end side, they were a combination of business and ITBAs and a couple tech leads. Product owners for the one company basically were also business BAs. There were no product owners in the other team. They basically committed to this person called a release manager. We'll get more into that later on. These were what would be called fully distributed teams. In other words, they didn't just have a team here, a team here, a team here. The members of single teams were distributed. Uh, City F, the first iteration, that they, were do they were doing um, four-week iterations, City F. Uh, they had one team of about 20 people. And they were distributed basically in one city on the east coast of the United States and um, a couple locations in India. The next iteration, they had three teams with about 15 people on each one of the teams. Um, and uh, that lasted for about five iterations. And then finally, they ended up with five teams of about the same number of people. And that's uh, what they kept going uh, up until about the time I left, 10 months later. Uh, at that point, they dropped back to four development teams and one what they called solutions team because of some issues they were running into, I can explain later. Um, City N had three week iterations. They started with five teams with about eight people. That went for about eight iterations. And then about halfway through the time I was with them, uh, they went from uh, down to three teams with about the same number of people. And that's what they went forward with it after, even after I left. Um, they had folks in, uh, besides India and besides the United States, they had them in Denmark and in Singapore. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, also. What was their physical environment? City F basically had committed up front to build basically a co-located uh, environment. They had dedicated team rooms that were within 30 feet of one another. Uh, they had a corporate-wide video, that, and they made sure that their offshore vendor had it as well. And so they did their daily stand-ups with video. 
And so they were, they were onshore, offshore, basically did their stand-ups together. And that, that required some interesting overlap and working from the onshore perspective. Um, but basically that's how they did it. And like I said, they had five teams, ultimately all within not many feet of one another. Um, City Ann, on the other hand, had Wi-Fi around their whole building, and they had conference rooms with audio. And that was kind of their environment for the teams who wanted to, to work that way. Um, they had one team that was kind of dedicated, but had to share a conference room. In other words, they, by sharing, I mean they had to share it with anybody else who wanted conference room space. So every single day, they met in a different room. And one of the jobs of the Scrum Master was to find out what conference room was available was big enough, because they could also only reserve rooms about a week and a half in advance, because the rooms were so heavily used by everything else. So you can imagine these people, now they could get away with it, because one of the main restrictions was we don't have to be plugged in anywhere, so we can go anywhere and do this. Um, the others worked and called in from their desks or their home or wherever they were in the world. Um, one of the big battles I had with, with City Ann was getting people who were, actually, who were co located to actually be willing to walk 30 or 40 or 50 feet and meet in a room together to have even the 15 minute stand up. Everybody was used to dialing into everything from everywhere. And again, people were used to working from home whenever they felt like it because nobody really expected them to be in the office. I was on the floor with that company, and I don't think I ever saw more than 10 people or 15 people on that floor. And that floor is as big as this whole building, one floor of this building, with cubes in it, basically. And I hardly ever saw more than 15 people at a time physically in the building. And there were more than 15 people working on just my project, or the project they were working on. So they had uh, four week sprints, they had seven to 12 of those sprints per release. And they were going to be doing some releases over the years. Now why were they releasing code every single month? Well, you can imagine with 2,500 to 3,000 offices, um, and all those people had to use the software every single day, they just couldn't start throwing things into production every week or every month. And uh, basically before they started, there had been a lot of upfront commitments, so they had planned that way. Also, part of the City X issue was, they were going to change out the hardware in every single one of those offices. They had PCs at that time that were seven or eight years old. And they, they determined in order to be able to do all this wonderful sharing and centralize all this data, that the PCs they had would never do it, would never make it. They just couldn't handle it. So part of the reason they were releasing things on a schedule they were is because they had massive amounts of other stuff that had nothing to do with the software changes that had to go into place, which was basically to rehost the whole thing take out most of the servers and replace it with stronger communication connections to a central location. So they had all kinds of other things going on. Uh, City Ann was basically doing uh, three plus one sprints of three weeks each. The, the, the plus one was to catch up on all the stuff we didn't get done in the first three sprints. It was the, uh, the just overflow, just in case we didn't think of something, we'll, we'll stick it in there. As far as daily stand-ups, uh, these folks had them every single day, worked really well. Almost from the very beginning, they followed the stand-up process really nicely, worked very effectively for them. Uh, for the first month, they, they didn't have the, the video, though. It was just over the phone. So basically, the offshore lead talked most of the time, to the frustration of the Scrum Masters. Um, the second month, they had two more teams and still didn't have the video. By the third month, everybody had the video, and everybody was talking about how wonderful the change it was. It also allowed the Scrum Master to actually see the people offshore and be able to encourage them more to speak for themselves, which was a, a, a cultural issue they had, they had overcome. City N had one team that was co-located, had a couple of teams that were uh, scattered in a couple of locations with phone in, and then they had one team that was the most interestingly distributed that I've ever worked with, which doesn't mean other people haven't. Their BA product owner type person was in Denmark. They had two developers on the East Coast of the United States. They had a developer and two testers on the West Coast of the United States. They had some more developers in India, three or four, and their Scrum Master was all by his lonesome in Singapore. That was their team. He ran two stand-ups a day just to get people on the phone at some kind of reasonable hour. And I used to be on the phone at 6.30 in the morning um, and at 10.30 at night, so I could sort of listen in and see how the stand-ups were going, and that's what he ran. Later on, I think it will come up again, but basically 
from what you've heard so far, City End's answer to most issues when I would raise it as, well, do you think it would help you if you did this or that, was, oh, we're used to working this way. And that was their reason for not making any changes when they just didn't feel like they wanted to bother, was we're used to working this way. What was their technical environment? Well, actually, City End has a better end of that one. <laughs> their teams were in charge of everything. Um, they didn't have any dependencies on anybody else for any of the code. Uh, they didn't have to hook up to anybody else's systems. Uh, they ran their own builds. They did whatever they needed to. It was all kind of wonderful. Uh, City F, on the other hand, had builds done by one group in one part of the country. Um, they had architecture, data, and object model groups who kind of were in control of that and weren't were sort of and weren't sort of part of the team. Uh, they had inter-team dependencies, which they managed to work out pretty good, uh, actually. And then they had other development efforts, one of them in a completely different state, um, that basically they had to interface with. Uh, the first phase of their work, the interface requirements were about two or three other systems. Uh, phase two of the work, which I wasn't there for, uh, but it prepared them for, they had 30 to 40 dependencies on other groups to do work for them that had to work so that their delivery of their software would work. So how did they communicate? Um, well, there was basically a couple of things they did. After the daily stand-ups, City F actually would meet with me uh, uh, during the day. Um, and they would also meet with their management. Usually the management meeting was within 30 minutes of the stand-up. And so they would get together in one of the manager's offices and there would be out another 10 people in there. Every single manager on the project, development manager, test manager, the build manager, this manager, that manager, all of them were there to hear the scrum master's report on the status of all the stories and any impediments that they thought management needed to work on. Tremendous amount of management commitment to participate and the management did follow up on this stuff and support the teams wonderfully. Um, the other, and then, and then usually, but just before, just after lunch, uh, the scrum masters might have meet in the cafeteria, so it's kind of like how they, uh, well, how's it going kind of thing. And I'd mention some things that I'd observed going on, and they'd talk about whether they'd like to address that or not. So basically, it was kind of a mentoring training session for them. Uh, I would do similar things with some of the management also. I didn't do much coaching of the teams themselves. I worked through the scrum masters. I didn't feel that... After a couple of weeks of just observing, I didn't feel that they really needed anybody in the room kind of um, making it look like the Scrum Masters needed coaching. So I, I basically let the teams focus on the Scrum Masters as their kind of authorities for the process and stuff. Um, City End basically had no Scrum Master daily coordination and they didn't meet with their management at all, almost ever. I found out later on that I was brought into City End technically to be a development manager. Coach was something that the consulting company I worked for said was what I was coming in for because that's what I did, but the company thought the consulting company was delivering a development manager to them that had agile experience. Basically because the development manager got too busy to pay attention to what the teams were doing. And so I wanted to hire a consultant to kind of be the intermediary between the teams and the actual management structure of the company. So how did they do planning? Well, City F actually decided to bring in field people to be involved with this project that was going to last for three full years. And those folks would do things like um, work on user stories, uh, work on use cases, uh, work on um, things like uh, managing uh, the, the backlog and all. Um, they also had co-located POs. Every single team had a product owner person on the team, and then there was a senior product owner that they would report to um, just to coordinate things uh, from the business perspective. And like I said, and they had these user teams. They had real users, real people from these 2,500 offices. Uh, they had about three of these teams who came in and were there to be uh, a resource for the teams to ask questions about how does this work in a real office? What would you do in a real office? It's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, both organizations, though, had product requirements, scope, budget, deadlines, basically pre-committed before they started to do this. Um, from a product requirements perspective, City N basically had this regional hierarchy. They met once a year. They had this two-month planning cycle. Uh, and at the end of that two-month planning cycle, this is what we're going to do for the next year. So, and this is what we expect to have delivered. So basically, there was this big bunch of stuff uh, that everybody knew they had to get done. Uh, 
as far as business commitment, like I said, there were these co-located POs, and so there was like instant turnaround and instant feedback on things. Um, the city of Anna had BA intermediaries. They really couldn't make any decisions. They were just people to ask questions of, and they'd go back, and sometimes maybe they get an answer in five to ten days on a requirements question. Hence, the one extra sprint at the end to do all the stuff that they couldn't get actually real big feedback on. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't guessed, you know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This made a presentation on how wonderful Agile worked in our organization. This is how it really worked in a few very large organizations. And by the way, this is how it really works in most of the large organizations I've been with. They have some, some issues that they, at the outset, are not willing to deal with, uh, and they sort of make accommodations in many ways. So, some specific things about observations. That, that was all by way of sort of telling you what was going on. That was level setting to what the, what the things were. Um, City and their scrum masters were generally not very keen on the role. I did some personal interviews of them after a few sprints uh, to ask them what they were going on. Uh, they were picked. They really didn't ask to do it. They were told this was a way to gain management experience, which is what they really wanted in the first place. They didn't want to be scrum masters. They were, they were BA leads or development leads who wanted an opportunity to gain management experience, and the company decided to do it in an agile manner. So they said, well, Scrum Master is the closest thing to a manager we have, so we'll make you Scrum Masters, and I'll give you management experience. Um, most of them felt they were giving up their BA and de development lead roles. And um, for most of them, they didn't like that. <laughs> they sort of like, liked being the person that pe people came to and, and kind of could give direction and be the lead, and, and, and said, here's the way to do it and stuff. So they didn't like the this, this step back role of Scrum Master really. Um, not that they were necessarily bad at it, they just really, this really wasn't what they wanted to do. Um, and they felt they really weren't prepared. They went to a two day Scrum Master class. Yes? Uh, I, I, you know, we're, we're working on implementing parts of Agile, right? We're scrum Lab, like presentation yesterday, in much like you just described. But, um, you know, I think we're struggling with the same difficulties. What, in your experience, is a project manager? Or Actually, project or managers and business BAs feel less like they're giving up a lot of what they do by becoming scrum masters. More technical IT BAs and development leads really feel like they're attached to the product a lot. And so they sort of don't like, most of them don't like the idea that they have to give up some of that I won't call it authority and control, but give up that I'm, I'm the go-to person now for, for decisions. Uh, you know, turning it back over to the team was, was kind of hard for them. Uh, not that they, they were necessarily totally bad at it, but ultimately I think all of them decided that they would eventually, after this project was over, not want to do this anymore. Um, one non-technical BA did like the role. This is the person who had no, no training whatsoever. Uh, this was a guy who was all by himself in Singapore. Uh, uh, he wanted training but never did get it. So I would like be on calls with him sometimes when we talk about things. I spent the most time talking to him, frankly. And then the one co-located Scrum Master who actually got his team together every single day and kind of insisted on working that way. Uh, and he's the one, so I don't know what this means. I don't, I don't know whether the person who had the worst situation to be a Scrum Master liked it the most. Maybe that was because he had to do it the least. Oh, really? Because basically he was just he was just like coordinating calls and sort of saying, "Is everything on track?" Yeah, because he really couldn't he couldn't do his scrum master role, frankly. Um, so in the end, uh, there was an expectation by the development manager that I would see a was supposed to be filling in for that one would do all the agile stuff like burn down, uh, but nobody really used it. Um, the teams were never trained how to use it, be it in tasks or in in story burn down. Um, it wasn't tracked and paid attention to by anyone, anyhow. Uh, and overtime was a normal week. So basically, when I started talking about the agile idea of a, of a sustainable pace, their sustainable pace was a minimum of 50 hours a week. So overtime was built into their schedule to start with. And that's, just, that's how we do things here. That's how we work here. Uh, the release manager really didn't, pay, didn't care about it. They, they didn't miss it. Um, his attitude was, I know these folks, I trust these folks to get the work done. Um, I mean, we've always just gotten it done. That was their project approach to tracking. So why bother with this agile stuff? And then, as I said before, all these requirements were kind of a given ahead of time. It was just a matter of how do we break it up into uh, 
um, three months of, of uh, four or three week sprints. That was a plan. So why bother planning? Uh, we got to do it anyhow. It all has to get done. So why bother being fancy about estimation planning? We just kind of get it done the best we can in these chunks of four, four three weeks breaks. So there's no value seeing the better estimation. But we're used to doing things this way. So the F, on the other hand, had some. Their big, one of their biggest issues was was defect reporting. Now they were using two different offshore uh, consulting firms. The development consulting firm evaluated their folks based on um, defects reported against them, and the testing consulting firm um, evaluated their folks on defects that they didn't let get by them, <laughs> basically, defects found compared to those that got past them. Well, you can imagine what that did. The scrum masters, um, we didn't know this was going on for like four months, five months into this whole process. Uh, and City F was working with these offshore vendors for years. And it's the way they always work. So nobody like even said anything about it. Uh, so what was happening was the offshore developers didn't really want to check in code too frequently. They wanted to bang the dickens out of it before they exposed it to uh, any of the onshore uh, testing. So I, we sort of overcame that. Um, I actually was back to visit them, and I would ask them about it, and they sort of still do that, but they made, what, they made an agreement. They made one agreement that no defects found during the sprint would go into any kind of tracking system whatsoever. The only defects that would get tracked were those that still existed by the end of the sprint, because they were willing to carry some defects over, and that didn't take more than two days to eliminate. Because, because of the planning cycle and the offshore cycle, uh, they basically said that the first couple of days, one of the things the offshore people would do uh, is they'd fix some of these trivial bugs. So if they could fix them in two days, they didn't put those into a tracking system. So the only thing that actually got tracked against anybody was something that was so serious it would take more than a couple of days to knock out by the end of the sprint. Uh, they had huge amounts of coordination problems. The second sprint when they had three teams, three teams of 15 people apiece, managed to deliver two points of functionality. Because they had a dependency on a group that threw some stuff over the wall that didn't work, and all the teams depended on, on one of the teams working, and that team depended on this stuff working, and they learned their lesson about how to, how to uh, anticipate these problems. Um, they also had unplanned data and, and object model architecture changes in the middle of their sprints. Um, and the builds were controlled by a remote, remote group, and they couldn't get two builds done a week initially. Within three or four months, we had it with the manager working very hard down to a build a day and two builds a day the last week of the sprint. Um, they had extensive retrospective change feedback. Uh, we, we established kind of a formal action item system. That was really for the managers. Um, and uh, they really did get an increase out of that. So they, they made some changes based on that. Uh, basically, their biggest problem with management was that somebody looked at the schedule and said, oh, you have to go this fast to get all the stories done. So there, that, that, that was a constant battle to this day. However, it's done very pleasantly among them. Everybody realizes that that really is the truth. If we're going to hit the schedules that the larger organization wants, we've got to do this. So everybody buckled down. Some of the, pro the product owners would pull back on some of the functionality in order to do that. So everybody cooperated to do it. Didn't mean people didn't work up overtime occasionally. Uh, but it wasn't like uh, you team are the only ones that have to do this. But initially, the Scrum Masters just went frantic over this. Like, this, is, this is not the right way to do Agile and stuff. But they came to certain accommodations, and everybody worked together to pull this off. Um, they had this, this solutions group that actually was a team that worked a sprint ahead. And one of their major goals was to shield the teams from dependencies that weren't really ready. So before the team would have to pick stories, this group had already kind of pre-qualified their dependencies and said, let's not pick stories that are dependent on this stuff because it isn't ready yet. And this helped them avoid a lot of studying and things like that. Uh, and initially, it was still a problem, though. So they were doing what I, what everybody calls scrum fall, fundamentally, at some levels. Uh, they fell into many waterfall patterns the first end days with this and that. It took us about uh, four or five sprints uh, for both of these groups to try to get out of it. Um, 
I've tried to teach her about what I call uh, uh, iteration in the head, not by the calendar and not by the clock. Um, they were basically saying, well, within this, within this iteration, we'll do waterfallish type stuff if we have to. I finally got them to understand what it meant to develop stuff in two hour increments and try to, try to uh, check things in from that point of view. Semi co located, very distributed. Uh, any, everybody who was co located loved it. And this is, a, this is a phrase that one of the people said to me. And I'll remember it forever and I'll say it over and over again every place I am. Uh, I'd love to hear that from every team that I have. We had to overcome a few culture differences. Engineering technology, not a big deal from that point of view. Um, the training was a big, serious problem. Uh, the main problem of the training was that people really were never introduced to the agile values and principles, and so they learned practices and techniques, and when they didn't work, they weren't sure where to go, which is why they eventually brought me in to try to uh, show them some of these things. And they got into all kinds of battles about what was pure and what was not pure, which was wasting a lot of their time, because all they knew was the technique says do it this way, if you don't do it that way, we're not doing pure agile. So there were battles over that. So my, my argument is, um, and I made it yesterday, uh, uh, understanding the values and the principles uh, would have helped avoid a lot of these problems, I believe. Um, but my work as an agile coach, uh, I think, kind of fits in with the, what's the last thing it said in the, the book? The guy's about to go to death. Well, it's a far, far better thing than I've done than I've ever done before being an Agile coach. And it's a far, far better place that I go to than I've ever been before. So that's my experience with, uh, with coaching, uh, and especially in large organizations. Thank you very much. <laughs>